Family, welcome back to the channel. We're going to be looking at the complete story of the Bible from front to back. Now, I'm really excited for this because I already know by the end of this video, the picture and message of the Bible is going to be much more vivid and clear. Because the Bible's oh, the Bible's huge. Like reading this entire thing will definitely take some time. But to just have someone kind of break it down to know where you're kind of going to be getting into if you do want to read the whole thing, it's going to be super dope. So, you don't have to look at this as a religious thing. This is more of like a historical, educational, or entertaining thing. Because at the end of the day, the Bible has been like the most influential book in the Western civilization, if not the entire world. So, and it also does have like a lot of historical figures in there that are verified that they actually live. Like Jesus Christ, you have King Solomon, King David. I'm just saying all this because I know there's going to be people that do watch this video that do believe that, you know, there's a lot of myths in the Bible and stuff like that. So let's give this video a shot. Let's see how they break down these different stories of the Bible from front to back. Let's get into it. Today, you will learn the complete history of the Bible and understand both the Old and New Testaments from Adam in the Garden of Eden to the death of Jesus' disciples. Without a doubt, when you finish watching this video, you will not be the same. You will love God's Word even more. Of course, this will only happen if you open your heart to the Word of God. If you have difficulty understanding the Bible, in this video, you will be able to comprehend it. And after watching everything that will be taught, I am sure that you will be edified and enlightened by the Scriptures. It all began at the beginning. Before the beginning, there was only God. He has never ceased to exist. He exists from eternity. He had no origin. He is the origin of everything. He was not created. He is the creator of all things. He did not begin to exist. He is the father of eternity. Eternity is an exclusive attribute of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. On the sixth day, God created man in his image and likeness, and from man, he created woman. Adam and Eve were created perfect, pure, and innocent. They had full communion with God. They lived delighted in God's garden as stewards of God's creation. However, they fell into sin, and the entire human race was plunged into this abyss of total depravity because we were all in Adam. Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. Out of jealousy, Cain killed his brother, becoming the first murderer and fratricide in history. Later, Adam and Eve had another son, Seth. Through him, a holy lineage began to emerge that turned to God. However, it didn't take long for the earth to be filled with wickedness and violence. God then decided to wipe out the man he had created from the face of the earth. But there was a righteous man, Noah. Therefore, God poured out judgment through the flood, saving Noah, his wife, and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, with their respective wives in an ark they had built. Through Noah's sons, God restarted the origin of various peoples. You Shem feel me? the father of the Semitic nations. Ham became the progenitor of African and Asian nations, and Japheth became the trunk of European nations. Later, God chose a family to form the people who would be the instrument. Wow, that's so crazy. So, so Noah's sons became the rulers of like almost all the nations of the world. I'm like the beginning of the second world, like the the restart after the flood. That's kind. Of, that's that's crazy to think about. Well. The, Noah, you know what I'm saying, the name Noah, but they that's built. crazy. Through Noah's sons, God restarted the origin of various peoples. Shem became the father of the Semitic nations. Ham became the progenitor of African and Asian nations. And Japheth became the trunk of European nations. Later, God chose a family to form the people who would be the instrument to bring the promised Messiah into the world. He called Abram from Ur, of the Chaldeans. Abram left his land and his kindred and became a pilgrim of faith, raising altars to God wherever he went. It continued with Abraham and his nephew Lot, who became the father of two nations, the Ammonites and the Moabites. When Abraham left Haran, he was 75 years old. God promised that he would have a son, the son of promise, 
and would be the father of a numerous nation, and all families of the earth would be blessed in him. Abraham waited eleven years for God's word to be fulfilled. Then Sarai, his wife, no longer believing in God's promise, gave her maidservant Hagar to Abraham to cohabit with. Thus Ishmael was born, who became the father of a numerous nation, the Arab people, the historical enemies of the people of Israel. When Abraham was 99 years old, God appeared to him and commanded him to go out of his tent and count the stars in the sky. Then he told him that his descendants would be as numerous. That's one tedious task. God, I go outside my tent, God's like, count the stars in the sky. I'm like, are you serious? I'm like, God, come on. Yeah, I'm like, yo, come on, the stars in the sky? That's like, that's like being asked to count grains of sand. <laughs> numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. But God also revealed that his descendants would be enslaved for a period of 430 years. God changed Dang. Abram's name, which means great father, to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. When the child of promise had not yet been born, Abraham was 100 years old, and his wife Sarah was 90 when Isaac was born. Isaac married Rebekah, who was barren. After 20 years of marriage, Rebekah was healed, and they had two twin sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau became the father of the Edomites, and Jacob, who received the name Israel. You know, another thing to think about, like, they used to get to, like, a really high number in age, like 90 years old, some people like 100, 120, you know, and still be maneuvering just like at a different pace than nowadays. Imagine how much wisdom you walk on the earth with. Like to have like 120 years of knowledge and wisdom, that's like, that's like different. Israel in his conversion became the father of the Israelites. Jacob had 12 sons and one daughter. Through Joseph, the second to last son, Jacob's family moved to Egypt with 70 people. There, they settled in the land of Goshen, a fertile region. These 70 people multiplied astonishingly. After 400 years in Egypt, they left under the leadership of Moses with 600,000 men, not counting women and children, roughly 2 million people. The journey through the desert towards the promised land continued. What was supposed to take three months took 40 years due to the people's unbelief and the 12 spies who were sent to explore the promised land. Ten of them returned with a pessimistic report and incited and mutinied the people against God and Moses. Faced with the giants of those lands, they felt like grasshoppers and diminished the power of God. Then, God punished them severely condemning all those people to perish in the wilderness, allowing only Joshua and Caleb, the faithful spies, to enter the promised land. The people of Israel wandered in circles in the desert for 40 years, one year for each day they spied out the land. The desert became the world's largest cemetery where the entire generation that left Egypt perished, except Dang. for the two men who dared to trust in God. After 40 years of wandering, we have six years of conquering the land under the leadership of Joshua, but there was still much land to conquer. Joshua, Moses' servant, introduced the people to the promised land through a calling from God and extraordinary empowerment. After Joshua's death, a long phase of 330 years of theocratic rule. Yeah, I know. I like how you said like extraordinary empowerment because I know in the book of Joshua, there's like so many times where he says like, don't be afraid and also have courage began called the period of the judges it was a time of great spiritual instability and ups and downs in israel's life during the time of the judges the people did as they pleased due to the hardness of the hearts of the people of israel they were oppressed by many enemies in this time god raised leaders of great stature such as gideon jephthah samson and samuel after this long period, a new phase came, the monarchy. The people of Israel, looking at the neighboring nations, requested a king. The people no longer wanted God to rule over them. Samuel, the last judge, then anointed Saul as king over Israel. Saul ruled for 40 years. He began well and ended badly. He opened the curtains of his reign with humility, 
but later succumbed to pride, cruelty, Dang. and ultimately rebellion and apostasy. It happens, After bro. him, David reigned in his place, also for 40 years, transferring the capital of Israel from Hebron to Jerusalem. His reign was successful. David strengthened his kingdom and became the most prominent king of Israel, accumulating wealth, conquering lands, defeating armies, walking with God, being a man after God's own heart, despite sinning gravely against God, his family, and his people. He repented and was forgiven by God. From his lineage came the Messiah. After his death, his son Solomon reigned in his place for 40 years. He asked God for wisdom, and God gave him wisdom and riches. He became a renowned man in his time, built the temple in Jerusalem, and enjoyed peace in his reign. However, due to his many wives, his heart was corrupted. Only in old age did Solomon turn to God and repent of his sin. Thus we had 120 years of the United Kingdom. Saul fell into the snares of witchcraft, David into the trap of adultery, and Solomon into the clutches of idolatry. God Dang. granted the people's... I'm assuming, I'm assuming he's saying idolatry for Solomon because he must have started to put women above God, and that's why he ended up falling like that. ...desire to have kings, but the people had to suffer the consequences of this unwise choice. After Solomon's death, the kingdom split because his son Rehoboam refused to heed the people's plea to ease... But the real quick, though, King Solomon is my guy, though. Because I'm pretty sure the book of Proverbs comes from him. And like just other wise sayings of the other wise people during that time. But it's such a good book in the Bible. Honestly, I would always suggest everyone in the world just look at it. Because it's like, it's short statements that are like straight and concise, straight to the point of just mad wisdom. It's great, yeah. Burdensome taxes. The pomp, splendor, and luxury of Solomon's government were sustained by the toil of the workers. Strangled by exorbitant taxes, they took advantage of the transition of power to demand changes. As they were not successful, they could not align with the new king. Thus, ten of the twelve tribes conspired against Rehoboam and followed a new leader, Jeroboam the Run, forming the Northern Kingdom, with its capital becoming Samaria. The Northern Kingdom lasted 209 years. This kingdom had 19 kings from eight different dynasties. None of these kings were righteous. All turned away from God and followed the ways of Jeroboam West. This king decided to use religion for political purposes, fearing that his subjects would seek Jerusalem to worship in the temple and become politically attracted to the kings of Judah. Jeroboam, I decided to build temples in the northern kingdom in Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba. In them, wow. he placed a golden calf and induced the people to worship it as if it were God himself. All 19 kings of the northern kingdom followed this path. All were wicked and perverse. None sought God. In that time, the Lord raised up some prophets to denounce the sin of the kings of the nation and the convenience prophets, as well as the priests bribed with money. In that time, God raised up the prophets Amos, Hosea, and Micah. They bravely confronted the nation's deviation. But guys, take note of that. This is so crazy. He had used, the kings of the 19 nations where all of them were unrighteous. They were not righteous men. And he ended up using religion to lead people away from God. To, to, become, to look more attractive. He was being decept, deceptive in his ways. And ended up forcing them to, to worship a gold calf. All that to say is just be careful when it comes to like, Religion. Religion is more so man-made tradition. You feel what I'm saying? But people become righteous when they actually have the relationship with God. There was never like really a religion thing. It was more so a relationship with God. That's crazy. From the palace to the huts, from rival temples to commerce, from the streets to the fields, they denounced political corruption and raised their voices against prostituted religion. They launched God's indictment against the corrupt executive and legislative powers. They denounced social injustice and economic oppression. They called the people to repentance, but their messages fell on deaf ears. During the reign of Ahab, 
Through his wife Jezebel, the pernicious belief in Baal, the Canaanite god of prosperity, spread throughout Israel. Wow. In that time, God raised the prophet Elijah to unmask this pagan deity and undermine the credibility of the abominable idol. Even in this kingdom, God called Elisha to replace Elijah and carry out a prodigious ministry. But as Israel refused to listen to the voice of God, the Lord used the language of the rod and brought Assyria against the nation of Israel. Assyria was the rod of God's wrath against Israel, an expansionist, warrior, and bloodthirsty empire. Whenever it conquered a people, it committed atrocities and barbarities against the conquered, typically leaving mutilated bodies and stacking heads at the gates of conquered cities, Jeez. subjecting people to the bitterest ignominy. After leading the northern people into captivity, King Sargon II sent a mix of other peoples to the land of Israel, forming a great racial mixing there. He knew that racial action would weaken the potential existence of a people. Thus, with this racial mixture, a hybrid people called Samaritans was formed in Israel, which became a bitter enemy of the people of Judah. The southern kingdom, composed of the tribes of Benjamin and Judah, had 20 kings, several of whom were godly, such as Asa, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, Jotham, Uzziah, Joash, and Josiah. Whenever a godly king ascended the throne, the nation prospered and grew economically, morally, socially, and spiritually. In the southern kingdom, to fulfill the prophecy that the Messiah would come from the house of David, only one dynasty ruled. To speak to the people of Judah, God raised up various prophets such as Isaiah, Micah, Joel, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah. The nation also became deeply corrupted, not heeding God's voice. Then in the same way, God disciplined them and sent the Babylonian army, delivering them into the hands of their enemies. The people of Judah were taken into Babylonian captivity. The southern kingdom, called Judah, lasted 345 years. Jeez. After two incursions, Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem, destroyed its glorious temple, and took the people into captivity, leaving the city in tremendous disgrace. The people were in captivity for 70 years, as prophesied by God to the prophet Jeremiah. During the captivity period, God raised up the prophets Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. In this period, the people were purified from idolatry, and synagogues emerged. After the time set by God, the people of Judah returned to their land. By that time, Babylon had already fallen into the hands of the Medo-Persian Empire. Cyrus, foretold by God 200 years before he was born, liberated the Jewish people and opened the doors for their return to the land of Canaan. The people returned in three groups under the leadership of Zerubbabel for the reconstruction of the temple, under the leadership of Ezra for teaching the law, and under the leadership of Nehemiah for the reconstruction of the walls and the political and spiritual restructuring of the people. As soon as so we're almost halfway through this video now, just to do like a little quick recap. So we started at the beginning with Adam and Eve. They end up sinning. Their children end up sinning. It was a very corrupted world. The flood happens, okay? So now we're at the point where like, there's a lot of people, a lot of different nations, people of different skin tones. And the world is still at a corrupt place right now. Like, people are, there's many unrighteous kings, there's people worshipping false gods at this point, worshipping sta statues. So this is kind of like where we're at right now. And it's just so crazy to think about how we have this knowledge accessible to us, because this is history before the history history we even learn in, in school. Like, this is some, we're able to recognize, like, our origins and where we came from and how the world led up to the place that we're at right now. As they returned from captivity and began the reconstruction of the temple, the Jewish people began to face problems. First, the cunning Samaritans wanted to join them in the work to destabilize it. Since the proposal for partnership was rejected, the Samaritans, in a second stage, began to threaten them. Then, the Samaritans wrote to King Artaxerxes, accusing the Jews of conspiring against the Medo persian kingdom. Faced with this nefarious persecution, the work on the temple was halted for about 20 years. During this period, the people relaxed in their zeal for the house of God 
and began to focus on their own businesses, building and beautifying their own houses at the expense of the house of God, which was in ruins. During this time, God raised up the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to call the people to repentance. The message of these prophets had a rapid and profound effect. The people repented and enthusiastically returned to complete the reconstruction of the temple. Then there was a great spiritual awakening, a rearrangement in families and the priesthood, and a wholehearted return to God. About a hundred years passed, and a new generation arose. Now the people continued to go to the temple and offer sacrifices, but they no longer honored God. They offered blind, sick, and lame animals to God as burnt offerings, despising the Lord's table and considering it defiled. The priests became corrupt and stopped teaching the word of God to the people. Wow. The family was deeply affected. Marriages began to fall apart, ending in divorce. The people no longer believed that God was capable of judging them, so they relaxed in returning tithes. Although he continued to attend the temple, he was far from God. At that time, Man, God... That's a, that sounds real familiar. I mean, we live in a generation where people really don't believe that, either don't believe God exists or don't believe that God judges them at the end of the day. Like, that's like the one true judge of our soul. So, it seems like, you know, you're just able to learn from the history and see, like, where it is still playing a part in today. Raised Malachi to call the people to repentance. This is how the Old Testament closed. 400 years before Christ, after the prophet Malachi. We have a long period of 400 years called the interbiblical period or period of prophetic silence. At that time, non-canonical religious historical books, the apocryphal books, were written. The Old Testament was also translated from Hebrew into Greek, giving rise to the famous version called the Septuagint. The Medo-Persian Empire fell to the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great, after conquering nations and kingdoms, died prematurely at 33 years of age, crying because he had no more lands to conquer. He powerfully expanded his empire, spreading Hellenistic culture and the Greek language, so useful later for the rapid and borderless dissemination of the gospel. With the death of Alexander, the kingdom fell into the hands of four generals, and it is important to highlight the dominance of the Egyptian Ptolemaics and the Syrian Seleucids, who were always in conflict. Israel was dominated sometimes by one, sometimes by another. At this time, Antiochus Epiphanes outraged the Jews by sacrificing a pig on the altar of the temple in Jerusalem, which was an abomination to them. This fact began the War of the Maccabees, won by Judas Maccabeus after much bloodshed. Later in the year 63 BC, Pompey conquered Jerusalem and the Romans came to dominate Israel. Herod the Great reigned in his place. Herod the Great was a great administrator, expanded and beautified the temple in Jerusalem, built the port of Caesarea, opening the way for international trade and facilitating... So just to give a little context behind the sacrificing of these animals, this is what they did as an offering to God, whether to thank him, or sometimes to actually get their sins forgiven. So this is that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. Missionaries travel around the world, built the fortress of Masada and many palaces and fortresses. However, Herod was an insecure and violent man. The fear of losing the throne tormented him throughout his life. He married 10 times and had many children. When he married Mariamna, a woman of nobility, he had all the nobles in his family killed for fear of losing his throne. At the request of his mother-in-law, he appointed what? Archelaus, his only 17-year-old nephew, as high priest of Jerusalem. But later, upon seeing that he was winning the favor of the people, he had him killed. His Wait, fearful mother so he killed all of his sons because he didn't want them to take the, the throne? That's... That's one heck of a fear right there. Losing the throne tormented him throughout his life. He married ten times and had many children. When he married Mariamna, a woman of nobility, he had all the nobles in his family killed for fear of losing his throne. At the wow. request of his mother-in-law, 
he appointed Archelaus, his only 17-year-old nephew, as High Priest of Jerusalem. But later, upon seeing that he was winning the favor of the people, he had him killed. His fearful mother-in-law fled to Egypt, but Herod sent his emissaries after her to kill her. Caesar Augustus called him to Rome for his atrocities. Before leaving, however, he had his wife Mariamna killed for fear that she would conspire against him in her absence. He later sent two of his sons to Rome everyone. to study. His sister Salome taught that they would return more prepared to take the throne. Herod did not hesitate. He ordered his two sons to be strangled. Before he died, he made his sister Salome swear that he would kill at least one nobleman from every family in Jerusalem because she wanted tears at his funeral. This was the man who was alarmed when he learned from the wise men that a boy had been born in Judea to be king of Israel. After Herod the Great died, around the year 4 BC, his kingdom was divided among four of his sons. Archelaus, one of Herod's sons, reigned over Judea, Samaria, and Edom. He was a terrible king. The Jews, in the end, asked the Romans to remove him from office. Rome, concerned about the constant problems in Judea, installed a Roman procurator or governor there. This is how the Romans began to directly rule Judea. At that time, Pilate was the governor. This catastrophic state and political situation in which the chosen people of God found themselves under the hateful power of the Herodians and at the mercy of slavery under the rule of the Romans made political hope for the Messiah manifest as never before, a cry for liberation and redemption from ungodly bondage. It was then at this time that Jesus, in the fullness of time, fulfilling biblical prophecies, was born in Bethlehem in Judea. The eternal word became flesh and dwelt among men. He lived among us, full of grace and truth. He put on human skin, put on the sandals of humility, walked on our land, ate our bread, drank our water, felt our pain, cried our tears, carried our sins on his body on the cross, and was resurrected in glory for our justification. Both Hellenistic and Roman cultures joined the Jewish contribution to the coming of the Messiah to the world. When Jesus was born, Palestine was under the rule of Rome. With the persecution of Herod the Great, Joseph and Mary fled with the baby Jesus to Egypt, staying there until the death of the wicked king. They returned from Egypt and settled in Nazareth, the city where they had previously lived. There, Jesus grew up as the son of a couple. Bro, like these kings were so wicked that once they heard that there was going to be a Messiah coming, born in, uh, born in Bethlehem, he had commanded like all the firstborn, like all the all the uh, boys that were under the age of like one or around one years old, one year old, to be killed. It's insane. Like that's that's like real wickedness right there, and it's like they could get away with it because they're the people in power. Carpenter. At the Physically. age of 30, he began his ministry, having been baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist, thus identifying himself with the sinners he came to save. There, in the Jordan, as Jesus prayed, the heavens opened and the Father spoke, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. At that same moment, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove, equipping him with power to begin his ministry. From the Jordan, Jesus was led into the desert by the Holy Spirit, where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, during which time he was tempted by the devil three times. The devil attacked Jesus to overthrow him, but the Son defeated him in the desert, always using the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. The devil overthrew the first in paradise, but was defeated by the second Adam in the desert. From the desert, Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, went to Galilee, arriving in Nazareth, where he lived most of his earthly life. He entered the synagogue, took the scroll of the book of Isaiah, and read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach, to heal, and to deliver. Jesus called twelve men, whom he named apostles, investing most of his time to train and disciple them. He traveled through Galilee, Perea, Samaria, and Judea, preached in cities, villages and fields, preached in synagogues and in the temple, 
preached outdoors on the beach and also in homes, preached to crowds and also to small groups. Jesus went everywhere doing good and freeing all those oppressed by the devil. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, gave sight to the blind, straightened the paralyzed, made the lame walk, gave hearing to the deaf, cleansed the lepers, freed the possessed, and raised the dead. It was the That's supreme guy right of there. God to men, given the name Emmanuel, God with us. He is God himself manifested in the flesh. Jesus came with a defined mission for all those to whom the Father gave him. He was born to die. He died so that we could live. The Apostle Paul was emphatic when he said that he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. His death was not an accident, nor was his resurrection a surprise. The devil used several devices to keep him away from the cross, but Jesus marched towards it like a king walks towards the crown. On the cross, Jesus crushed the serpent's head and triumphed over principalities and powers, exposing them to contempt. On the cross, Jesus completed the work of redemption. On the cross, he freed us. Death could not stop him. On the third day, Jesus rose again for our justification. Before ascending to heaven, he instructed his disciples to remain in Jerusalem, awaiting the Father's promise until they were endued with power. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus talks about the empowerment given by the Holy Spirit and also gives the strategy of action to follow, to be witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Bro, it's like, this, this is just starting to click more and more, bro. Because realize how throughout, throughout all the history that we just watched, everything was named like kingdoms. There were, you had the rulers and then you had the kingdoms and the rulers of the kingdoms. And as we watch Jesus, you know, perform all these miracles, be perfect, always doing good. In my mind, I'm like, yo, he needed to be the, he needed to be the freaking king. Like he needed to be the ruler. You know what I'm saying? So, but then I'm like, yo, he is the ruler of a different kingdom, of the kingdom of heaven, the unseen kingdom. I'm like, yo, that's where the faith comes in. You feel what I'm saying? That, that right there is where the faith comes in. Because it's like, he is the king of heaven. That's his kingdom. Is it as, as, as wow? Yeah, wow. Just need, need to share one with ya. After Pentecost, also gives the strategy of action to follow, to be witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends. And of that, the that, that's also why in the Our Father it says, "Thy kingdom come, Thy kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven." His kingdom is in heaven. Earth. After Pentecost, the church exploded in Jerusalem with astonishing growth. Multitudes were continually added to it. The growth and expansion of the Jerusalem church is recorded by Luke up to chapter 7 of the book of Acts. As the church was still limited to Judea, Wait, I'm not gonna lie. Heaven, the astonishing growth. Like, this video is moving a little fast. We're going to leave it off from right here. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus talks about the empowerment given by the Holy Spirit and also gives the strategy of action to follow, to be witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After Pentecost, the church exploded in Jerusalem with astonishing growth. Multitudes were continually added to it. The growth and expansion of the Jerusalem church is recorded by Luke up to chapter 7 of the book of Acts. As the church was still limited to Judea, God sent persecution against it, and the believers were scattered, carrying the word wherever they went. This is how Philip arrived in Samaria, breaking through the walls of enmity and preaching the gospel there with power. The people rejoiced to hear and see the things that God did through Philip, the preaching deacon. He spoke and did, preaching to the ears and eyes. Through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, Peter and John, the Samaritans also received the Holy Spirit. The gospel spread beyond the borders of Israel with the conversion of the persecutor of the church, 
Saul of Tarsus, on the road to Damascus. Later, a Gentile church, the Church of Syrian Antioch, became the mother of cultural missions. After this, Barnabas and Saul left for their first missionary journey in the regions of Galatia, passing through Purge, Derby, Iconium and Lystra, establishing churches and constituting presbyters. On the second missionary trip, Paul and Silas went to the provinces of Macedonia and Achaia, planting churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea and Corinth. From Syrian Antioch, Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians, to Corinth and the two letters to the Thessalonians. On the third missionary trip, Paul visited the province of Asia Minor, remaining three years in Ephesus, the capital of the province, from where he wrote the two letters to the church in Corinth. In this cosmopolitan city of more than 300,000 inhabitants, there was the temple of the goddess Diana, a marble palace four times larger than the Parthenon in Athens, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In the years that Paul spent in Asia Minor, churches were planted throughout the province, such as those in Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Colossae, and Hierapolis. Due to the famine that ravaged the world in the times of Emperor Claudius, the Jews were expelled from Rome, as recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 18, verse 2. Paul then made a large collection among the Gentile churches to take to the poor in Judea. When embarking towards Jerusalem, he informed the elders of Ephesus that what awaited him from city to city were currents and tribulations. However, he did not consider his own life to fulfill his ministry of proclaiming the gospel of God's grace. Before embarking for Jerusalem, he wrote his most robust epistle, the letter to the Romans, where he shared his desire to visit the capital of the empire and share the word with the church, being sent by her to Spain. Despite bringing significant financial aid to the poor of Judea, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and from there transferred to Caesarea, where he was accused for two years by the Jews under the aegis of governors Felix and Festus. Faced with Festus's tendency to hand him over to the Sanhedrin who planned his death, Paul, using the privileges of his Roman citizenship, chose to be tried in Rome. On the journey to the capital of the empire, he faced a terrible shipwreck. The boat completely fell apart, but all the passengers and crew were miraculously saved, as God promised Paul. On the island of Malta, where they arrived, a viper bit Paul's hand, but God neutralized the serpent's lethal venom and even used his servant to heal all the sick on the island. So the Maltese sent Paul to Rome with all his needs covered. There, he remained imprisoned for two years in a rented house. From there, Paul evangelized the Praetorian Guard, encouraged believers to work, and wrote letters to the Ephesians, the Philippians, the Colossians, and Philemon. After this period, Paul was released from prison and then wrote the first letter to Timothy and the letter to Titus. But from the year 64, the persecution of the... Yo, so Paul wrote a, like a lot of the New Testament. Like a lot. Church, instead of being religious, became political and Paul returned to prison, being locked up in a dungeon, a dark, damp, and unhealthy underground cellar. On the 17th of July in the year 64, the city of Rome, with more than a million people, was burned. Nero, the emperor, dressed as an actor, climbed to the top of Maecenas's tower, from where he observed the amazing spectacle of the flames devouring the city. There were seven what nights and six days of fire. When the flames went out, 70% of the city was destroyed. Of the 14 neighborhoods in Rome, 10 of them were devastated by the flames. The four neighborhoods, densely populated by Jews and Christians, gave Nero an alibi to blame Christians for the burning of Rome. A brutal persecution of the church then begins. There was a lack of wood to make crosses, such was the number of believers crucified. Believers were tied to poles, covered in pitch, and burned alive to light up the Knights of Rome. It was a real massacre. Wow. From this second prison, Paul wrote his last epistle, the second letter to Timothy. In it, he related the arrival of his own martyrdom and the glorious hope of taking possession of the crown of justice. Thus, around the year 67, 
the veteran apostle was beheaded, leaving, however, a blessed legacy for later generations, the New Testament. It was written over a period of 50 years. We have four graphic books, the four Gospels, and three are synoptic, that is seen from the same perspective. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew's focus is to present Jesus as the King of the Jews, written for the Jews, contains the largest volume of quotations from the Old Testament and is the most Jewish of the Gospels. Mark books, the four Gospels, and three are synoptic, that is seen from the same perspective. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew's focus is to present Jesus as the King of the Jews, written for the Jews, contains the largest volume of quotations from the Old Testament and is the most Jewish of the Gospels. Mark's focus is to present Jesus as a servant, written for the Romans. It is the Gospel that focuses on the works of Jesus more than his teachings. Luke's Gospel emphasizes Jesus as the Son of Man, written for the Greeks by a Gentile doctor, historian and traveler. Its purpose is to present the portrait of Jesus as the perfect man. Therefore, Luke is the evangelist who speaks most about Jesus' prayer life and his ministry carried out in the power of the Holy Spirit. John, written at the end of the first century to refute Gnosticism, a pernicious heresy that denied the divinity of Christ, has a different approach than the others. He proves that Jesus is truly God and truly man. John selected seven miracles performed by Jesus and seven I am statements, proving that Jesus is indeed God. We also have the Acts of the Apostles, which report facts related to the early church, from its birth to its expansion to the city of Rome. Three churches led this advance, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Ephesus. Four provinces of the empire were reached, Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia, and Asia Minor. The Book of Acts has no conclusion as the history of the Church continues. We are heirs and continuators of the Church that was born at Pentecost. We also have the Apostle Paul's letters to the Churches of Rome, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae and Thessalonica, as well as his personal letters to Timothy, Titus and Philemon. Furthermore, we have a letter sent to the Jews who were being tempted due to persecution to go back in faith which is the letter to the Hebrews by an unknown author. We also have the general letters written by James, Peter, John, and Jude. Finally, we have an eschatological book, the Apocalypse, which narrates the triumphal victory of Christ and his church, written by the Apostle John on the island of Patmos around the year 96. I hope you learned about this story. God bless your life. If you have not yet accepted Jesus as your savior, there is still time. Repent, he can change your future, your story. He can take away all the sadness, all the loneliness, and provide what you need. Go into your room, close the door, and talk to God. He will hear you. God bless you. If you liked the video... Hey, bruh. It's also the fact that we have those letters that were written. Like, the letters that Paul, that, that Paul wrote to all those different cities, like Corinth, or the letters that were written to Timothy... The fact that we have those letters and the manuscripts of that is what it's just like. It's just sealing the cake. It's sealing the deal. It's the cherry on top. What the icing and the whole entire, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, but that that brings it from that brings it from the beginning of time, the be, the literal beginning of time to the fall of man. To the redemption of man through Jesus and through the spreading of what happened and what Jesus did on the cross. So people may believe and people may join him, join him in his kingdom rather than these kingdoms that are ruled by unrighteous people. Because that was the main problem that they were facing during the time of when Jesus came. King Herod was killing people literally left and right. There was one, I don't know if I don't know if this was King Herod, but that one king that that was killing his family because he didn't want him to take the throne, like the 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 throne. Like the the wickedness was there and being exposed. So Jesus came 
and redeemed them from that and said, hey, look it, you could join me in my kingdom, but my kingdom's not here. My kingdom's in heaven. By believing in me, you got that. You feel me? So, yeah, that was a, that was a, there was a lot of information in there, a lot of different, a lot of history. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. Make sure you do smash the like button, turn on post notifications, and subscribe if you are new and watch to this point. Literally, only makes sense. Peace, love y'all.